Okay. All right, are we ready to get going? It's Tuesday. We're off to a good start yesterday. I think we everybody had a good day. I heard a lot of good feedback. Big day today. Lots going on. Pack schedules. It's really hard. I know from t working with the folks that are scheduling and trying to get all the meetings set up, in addition to all the sessions that go on, there's just so much going on here, which is what I think we, we wanted. It's, it's controlled chaos a little bit. We do want to recognize our sponsor again, Arrow, who makes the, the Dragon Board. Uh, lots of stuff going on. They will actually have a table outside here today and during the week, so you can go talk to those folks. I'm sure they'd like to talk to you. We're doing a lot of stuff on the Dragon Board. It's really compellingly interesting to us and to the community, and we really appreciate their sponsorship. We do want to w welcome another new member today. The new member is Acadine Technologies. We're really excited to have Acadine on board. They've joined LMG. Acadine is uh, the maker of H5OS. And we'll give you some more, a little bit more information about that this week. But really interesting. We're really happy to have Acadine on board. And please join me in welcoming them to the Lenaro family. I was also reminded that I inadvertently omitted LeMaker, which is also another exciting new member of the Lenaro family and in the uh, 96 Boards community. And they'll also have a table here, and they'll be, they'll be sharing more information about what they're, what they're up to uh, in the 96 board space. So Lenaro continues to grow really quickly, and, and we're excited about that because it benefits everyone. Just some schedule notes from today. So today is LMG and LHG day. There are lots of sessions related to this. There, we have some keynotes this morning. Instead of doing anything, the sessions are gonna start directly after the opening session today. So when we're done in here, when the keynotes are done, feel free to go directly to your first session of the day. Lunch is, continues to be in the atrium starting at 1 p.m. Just out of curiosity, how many people didn't know that was vegan beef at, at lunch yesterday? Just raise your hand. Was I the only one? Just a few people. Most of the people, I guess, read the sign. It was interesting. Uh, the hacking rooms are open today, so feel free to, to pop in. You can go to your team's ha hacking room, but also pop into other teams. And anyone who's not part of one of the hacking rooms, if you're interested in talking to that team, it's a great place to go, meet the folks on the team, and get some a chance to do some one-on-ones in those rooms. And I've heard tremendous feedback about that sort of opportunity just to sit down and, and chat with the various teams and the engineers and the tech leads on the teams. It's really good stuff, so take advantage of it. They're all here today. Um, the evening is free tonight for team meals, and check with your team lead about where you're going. The HR office, so the doctor is in, in, uh, in Bayside A, if you want to talk to HR, if you're an hour employee, they're down there, they're ready. They're there and they're ready to help. So please feel free to stop by any time today. We've also conducted three different surveys that are going on right now. I need to remind you, and I'm going to ask to enlist your help. If you are an employee, you received an employee survey, we need your feedback. If you haven't completed it, complete it. If you're an assignee engineer, you also have received a survey. Please complete it. We're ending the survey at the end of September. It should only take five minutes to do it. And we really value and take in the feedback. And those surveys are completely confidential. We have no idea who fills out the survey, who's giving us the feedback, other than you're an employee, you're an assignee. So please, and we're going to resend the links to you today. So if you missed the email or you, maybe it went into your spam folder or something, we'll resend you the links. But please take the, take the few minutes to give us the feedback. It's our only way to really make sure that we understand what people are thinking and that it gets better. And the last survey is also critically important. It's targeted at our members, management, and executives. And so if, if you haven't filled out your survey and responded, please do so. It's really, really important. We take this stuff very seriously, and it's a great vehicle for communication, and we measure ourselves. We did these surveys last year. And so now, with your feedback again this year by people participating, and you really need the participation, it will enable us not only to understand what's going on right now and address things that we need that need to be addressed and see the themes and the issues, uh, but it also allows us to, to look at the trending. Are we getting better at what we're doing or uh, are we not getting better? And so we need to understand that, the management team in Lenaro. So I, I just can't emphasize enough. Please, please fill out your survey. Take a few minutes and do it. We, we take the feedback seriously. So uh, on Wednesday night, we used to have this thing called the member services dinner and the VP... Uh, the, the steering committee VIP soiree, and they were two different events, and they were really good events, but there was a lot of the same people were going to both. Not that that's a bad thing. And we really felt like, well, what if, what if we took these two events and we combined them together? 
And that's exactly what we did, and we're trying it this time. And it's called the VIP member event. And it takes place on Wednesday evening. It's, it's local. And again, we've sent out invitations to, the, to if you're on the steering committee or VIP or you fit in a bunch of different categories. You've received an invitation. If you haven't responded yet, we'll send that invitation again today. So you'll see it in your email. But please let us know if you could by the end of the day today. Just say, you know, let us know if you're coming or not coming, either way. And so we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to get, go to that thing. And the, the turnout has been really great for the fifth birthday bash, which is taking place Thursday night. So a lot of you uh, gave us your responses. It's almost full. So if you haven't responded yet and you want to go to the fifth birthday bash, please fill that out today. So there are two competitions here. One is on the Lanaro bag, so the goodie bag. So hopefully everybody got a goodie bag. If you didn't get a goodie bag or, uh, as part of it, please go to the desk. They'll give you one. There's something on that bag. Look closer at it. And if you can figure it out, it will tell you what to do. And once you've figured out what to do, do it. And there is a prize involved, a, a big, a good prize, a really good prize. And there's also, as we traditionally do, there's also a photo contest for, for uh, a photo competition for the most interesting photo of the event. And we already have a couple really interesting submissions. And the photos, as is our tradition, go get posted up to Facebook and people like them. And so the more likes you get, the, the the photo with the most likes basically wins the prize. And it is another good, really good prize. It's a, it's a prize that you'd want. And uh, there's an advantage if the sooner that you get the photo in, of course, the more time it's up on Facebook, the more time it has to get likes. So uh, take photos as you see, use your camera. We all have them on, the, on our phones or whatnot and, and send them in. Send them into competition at lenara.org and we'll post them up on Facebook. And there'll be some really great prizes that we'll award for both these categories on Friday. So there's a robot going around SFO 15. Has anybody noticed this? And it's like, what? what? What's up with that? And so I'll tell you what's up with it. So this is actually Wookie, who's been a Lenaro assignee from ARM forever, since the beginning. And being carbon footprint conscious, uh, he decided to stay in Cambridge. And the idea came up of, well, what if, we, what if we got one of these robots and it's capable of moving itself around? He can steer it around. I'm told that he really doesn't get good perspective, 3D perspective, as to where he really is. So if you see him running into a wall or something, maybe take a closer look. Uh, <laughs> wandering around the bathroom, probably not a good thing. Um, but uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. And so he's basically in Cambridge, UK, and he's participating in Connect through this robot. And uh, it's, it's making its way around here. Now, Dave, Dave, could you, could you confirm? Uh, I heard a rumor that, that there, was a, there was a prize for anybody who was who, who could hack the robot? <laughs> no, you can't confirm? <laughs> okay. Anyways, it's a pretty interesting thing. We're trying it out. It'll be interesting feedback. The robot actually comes with the bow tie that's on there, which I think is interesting. And then Arwen added a badge so you know that it's Wookiee there. And uh, it should be pretty interesting. Get cool feedback on it. We'll see how it works out. This is the first Lenaro Connect. Not, not UDS, we did UDS and other things, but this was the first real standalone Lenaro Connect. Anybody who's in this photo? Do you know if you're in this photo? Raise your hand. Okay, we still got quite a few. So this was in Camborne, UK, which is, which is next, to, uh, next to Cambridge. It was an interesting week for a number of reasons. This is this little tiny pond that's outside the place. There's actually a, a life preserver there, which I never really completely understood. But uh, yeah, this is the Lenar first Lenaro Connect. So I thought, I thought as part of the five-year thing, we would, we would look back a little bit as we kind of go along here during the week. So we also put together a five-year Lenaro commemorative t-shirt, especially for engineers. And I can tell you there's one for everyone in this room, for everyone who registered for Connect. We have a, a commemorative t-shirt for you. We think that you like it. We put together a really nice shirt. Um, and we hope that you enjoy it and it's specialized. It commemorates this five-year birthday that we're, we're celebrating this week. And we're going to try to do this in, a, in an orderly fashion. It's hard to do, but we're going to try to do it. So when you filled out your registration, it asked you what size sh shirt you wore. And so based on that, we ordered the shirts based on the numbers of the sizes for everybody. So the team out front at the registration desk, they have the list of everybody's name. They have what, what size you put on. If your name starts from uh, with the letter A to I, go anytime today to the front desk and pick up your shirt. And then we'll do this over the next three days and we'll get them, we'll get them out to everybody. So hopefully everybody enjoys that. Uh, just to mention the water conservancy thing again, uh, I did have a couple questions yesterday. We still want you to take showers. I'm not trying to discourage anyone <laughs> from taking a shower. Uh, so please do that. But 
but try to be conservative of water. It's, it's, it's a, pre a really precious resource here, and we want to be good guests. So we do have two keynotes today, uh, somewhat uh, well, related to the theme. So Neil Trivet from Kronos is here. He's going to talk about open standards and open source. And then John Simmons from Microsoft is here. He's going to talk about the web and digital DRM. And so we think that that will be pretty interesting. And so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce you to Neil Crivet from Kronos. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to Lenaro and the organizers for the chance to speak to you this morning. Uh, I think it's actually a really good time to be talking. I'm doing the slides. I've got myself quite excited. There's a lot of uh, stuff we should be doing uh, together and I hope to have the chance to uh, tell you why. So I'm Neil Trevitt. Um, my day job, I work, actually work for NVIDIA in the mobile group, but by night uh, I run the Kronos group. I'm the elected president. I'm also the chair of the OpenCL working group uh, there. And I'm going to give you an overview uh, of what, what we're doing and why it's relevant to uh, Lenaro. And um, as I was listening to the keynotes yesterday from George and Simon, I was really struck by how similar the core values of Kronos are to Lenaro. At, at the core of everything is the belief that cooperation can really generate business opportunities, both for the membership uh, and for the larger industry. And it's true for Lenaro, it's very much true for Kronos as well. The key difference, though, perhaps, between Kronos and Lenaro is you guys are primarily focused on open source, whereas Kronos, our primary work product, are specifications. We love open source, too, and we're beginning to use it more widely, which is one of the mutual opportunities that we have. But our, our core mission is to produce API specifications and associated conformance tests uh, that people can use royalty-free widely throughout the industry. And we have a very specific focus. There are many different types of APIs. The APIs that we uh, focus on are at the software silicon boundary. So we're doing foundational APIs that pretty much well, every platform will need for graphics, for parallel computation, increasingly for vision and camera processing. Um, and um, we want to make the APIs that will make uh, people in the industry uh, successful and able to build uh, new products. We're actually celebrating our 15th birthday today. Um, we have a lot of uh, APIs out there. We have about 15 different API initiatives. Uh, our APIs are used um, primarily because they're used on mobile uh, on over a billion devices uh, a day. We have currently 130 uh, members. Uh, Lenaro is one member. We've invited Lenaro to be a member of Kronos to encourage good communication uh, between the two groups. But we have a lot of joint members too. Um, and these animations took many hours, so please do appreciate them. <laughs> uh, the board of Kronos, we have several joint members, including ARM, and um, we actually have a total of around 16 uh, joint members. So again, another opportunity to have good communication uh, between uh, the two groups. So I mentioned we have around 15 different uh, working groups rather than go through boring PowerPoint. We put together a short video that shows some of the uh, APIs that we do and how they might be used. So let me just uh, run that video. It's just a, just a minute or two. And if you have, yep, thanks. So this goes through and just tries to show uh, some of the APIs that Kronos has been developing. Some are quite new, some are much more mature. Uh, OpenGL was the original 3D API, um, originally developed by Silicon Graphics 20 years ago, taken over by Kronos around 10 years ago, used in workstations and desktops primarily. OpenGL for graphics, OpenCL for compute, parallel computation. And I'll be talking a little more about OpenCL and give you an update on that in just a second. But then we took OpenGL at oh, top Collada, yes. We do some file formats as well as APIs. Collada for authoring, 3D asset interchange, and GLTF for WebGL, uh, runtime, uh, asset streaming. OpenGL, yes, is the embedded systems uh, version of OpenGL for 3D on embedded and mobile systems. And it's used in mobile, but also increasingly in embedded markets like automotive. 
But then we have some other uh, APIs that may not be quite so well known. EGL started out as a Windows utility library. It's grown into kind of the hub, interop hub, by which a lot of the graphics and video APIs uh, interoperate. And vision processing and sensor input is really uh, a really strong area of interest amongst the membership. You have a couple of media APIs, Open SLES for audio processing, which actually is part of Android, and Open Max for video uh, processing and streaming. Augmented reality is kind of like a lighthouse application use case that we've been aiming for. We have a number of APIs that are working around the AR space stream input for sensor fusion. Uh, we have Open VX, which is uh, kind of an up and coming API, it's still quite new, uh, for vision acceleration that is intended to bring vision into very low power domains. I think it would be relevant to some of the things that uh, I heard discussed yesterday. Open KCAM is an open standard way of uh, controlling the ISP and the camera um, sensor subsystem. That's quite a new spec, still gathering requirements. We have some more APIs that may not be quite so well known. OpenGL SC is a close relation to OpenGL ES, but for safety critical. Now we're showing it being used in avionics here, and that's where originally uh, the, the idea originally came from. But it's increasingly being asked for in automotive. Then lastly, back going back onto the mobile devices, WebGL and WebCL, uh, bringing compute and graphics into HTML5. Now, I'm not gonna be talking about those so much today, but if you're interested in that, please do come and talk to me. I'm gonna be here uh, all day. So hopefully that gave you an idea of kind of the spectrum of things that Kronos is, is working on. So our organization seems quite similar to Lenaro. We have a working group for each of those APIs. We have a total of 15 active right now. Their primary work products are royalty-free specifications that are freely available on the website for anyone to download. We, and we also have conformance tests and an adopters program, which is the process by which you use those tests to become conformant and then you get granted the trademark and the IP rights. So adopters in the industry, they'll use the tests and the specification to create products. The working groups also create documentation for the developers. Developers obviously just use the implementations of the APIs on the products that they have access to. And increasingly, we're, we're trying to uh, create educational uh, oriented materials, course notes, um, uh, educational guidelines uh, to encourage these APIs to be taught widely in, in academia. So what are, what are these APIs are relevant to uh, Lenaro? So I was trying to pick the, the top handful of things that we could give you an update on that hopefully would be relevant to what you're trying to achieve uh, here. The ones that I've, I've chosen today for mobile, OpenGL ES, 3D graphics, uh, especially on Android. Um, OpenCL uh, is actually shipping an embedded mobile, desktop, and increasingly server space. So it's definitely uh, interesting, I think, to enterprise. And then digital home and IoT, OpenVX, low power, low cost vision processing for um, scanning people, facial recognition, gesture, uh, UI input, uh, all kinds of things, I think, that people will want rich interaction with devices in their home. So we'll give you a brief update on each of these. And also the new generation of APIs, primarily Spear, um, Vulkan, but also Spear. Spear is our intermediate representation, a close cousin to uh, LLVM, because we're increasingly using open source in this new generation of APIs, and that's really the engine for which uh, I think we should be uh, grasping the opportunity to work closer together. So let me go through each of these very briefly to give you the very latest information. OpenGL ES uh, is quite uh, mature spec. It first shipped in 2003. It's gone through seven, uh, up, several updates. Um, in 2014, that's last year, at Google I.O., uh, Android 
uh, announced that Android L had adopted uh, OpenGL 3.1 with uh, an Android extension pack. OpenGL ES is now the most widely shipped uh, 3D API in the history of the known universe. Uh, we estimate that 1.7 billion devices will ship with OpenGL ES uh, this year. Um, it's primarily OpenGL ES2 because it's obviously more mature. It's been around for a while, shipping on uh, high volume, low cost devices. But OpenGL ES3 is catching up pretty fast. This is the Unity statistics um, for people playing mobile games. And OpenGL ES3 is up to 40% uh, penetration. Now, as well as Android L using uh, OpenGL ES 3.1 at Google I.O. last year, uh, Android also uh, announced the AEP, Android Extension Pack, which brought a lot of console and desktop class graphics uh, as extensions, and a pack of extensions to Android. And I don't know how many of you are up to date with how good mobile graphics have got, but let me show you a demo. It, it, it is a year old, but it's still pretty amazing. This is using the Unreal Engine from Epic. And it looks like a pre-rendered cutscene, but I, I swear to God, it's not. It's, it's actually being rendered in real time. Well, this is a video. But it's a capture of it being rendered in real time on a mobile device uh, running Android L. So that quality of graphics is now widely available on Android uh, uh, systems. That is last year's silicon as well. So the silicon is getting even better as well. And at GDC this year, uh, we announced OpenGL ES 3.2, which actually brings all of the AEP functionality from extensions into the core. So OpenGL ES 3.2 has all of that functionality you've just seen, plus more. There's ASTC, which is the Kronos um, Texture Compression Standard that can be cross-vendor. Um, and important things like debug and robustness for security, particularly important for WebGL and other um, uh, web-based applications that run untrusted code from the net. So that's OpenGLES. OpenVX, as I mentioned, I think is going to be very um, critical to a lot of markets, such as automotive, such as IoT embedded. Um, but the challenge is to bring the power down uh, so we can uh, not have fans, low cost on um, battery powered devices. Uh, a lot of people using uh, OpenGL compute shaders or OpenCL uh, for vision, but those would kind of require you to boot up a whole GPU and a powerful CPU complex. We want to bring vision processing right down into low power hardware with a very minimal uh, runtime uh, CPU. And that's the aim of OpenVX, to have a single framework that can go from everywhere from multi-core CPUs and GPUs all the way down through DSPs into, uh, into low power uh, hardware cores. And the way we do that is to have a higher level of abstraction. And abstraction is graph-based, which gives the implementer of OpenVX the opportunity to optimize how that vision graph, that the connection of different vision 
operators, we call them nodes, um, actually get to execute on the runtime system. That graph is declared up front, so if the implementer can and wants to, they can implement uh, an optimized graph execution uh, runtime. So for example, if you are running it on a GPU, you might split the image up into tiles, and tiles would fit into the GPU cache, and you'd run it a tile at a time uh, without going backwards and forwards for memory. If it's a more of a software or DSP based, you might begin to do node fusion. It's entirely up to you how, how you optimize, but you have this extra level of detail in uh, the graph configuration uh, before execution starts. Once the graph is running, you very, need very minimal CPU interaction, so this can be run on very you know, uh, low configured uh, CPU systems. How many people here know OpenCV? A few. So the open source um, vision library that's been used quite widely is OpenCV, and you know, we're trying to work hard to complement OpenCV um, but it, OpenCV is an open source program. OpenVX is a specification-based initiative from Kronos. And the two have different strengths and weaknesses. Both are good, um, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's kind of instructive as Kronos and Linaro figure out how the best work together, kind of to use this as an example of what are the different strengths and weaknesses of the different uh, approaches. OpenCV is this very extensive, broad, um, library of thousands of vision um, functions. OpenVX, we have a specification to define and test, so it's much more um, focused, much smaller uh, in scope. We try to hit the right functions, uh, and we make it extensible, but it is a much smaller uh, surface area than OpenCV. OpenCV has uh, quite a few tests, but there's no uh, official conformance adopters program, so you get an OpenCV implementation, there's no guarantee that everything is going to be there or going to work, where it's OpenVX, if it's conformance, it, it has to pass the tests. Um, and the way it's used is different. People you do use OpenCV, they develop on desktop, and then when they port to a mobile uh, system, they will typically refactor the code, take the bits that they need, bring it over onto their uh, mobile system which can be great for certain types of projects. OpenVX, though, is intended to be a library-based solution. Typically, your silicon vendor will be implementing an optimized OpenVX because the specification is tightly defined to make that possible, and your library will be there for applications to reliably call uh, on, on the runtime system. So again, pluses and minuses, strengths and weaknesses for the two different uh, approaches. OpenVX status, still quite new. Uh, VX 1.0 was shipped in October, just a few months ago. Well, I guess it's almost a year ago now. Um, we've done a up maintenance release, 101. We have an open source uh, sample implementation. All the conformance tests are available. The first conformant products are beginning to ship. Okay, so let's move on to OpenCL. So uh, OpenCL for compute. Um, the whole idea of OpenCL is that you can use a single programming framework on a system that have, may have many diverse, heterogeneous, different processing resources, CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, blocks of hardware, even FPGA uh, elements. And the OpenCL framework lets you program consistently in that framework to take advantage of all those different processing elements. The way we do that, we have two APIs and some languages. So we have a C platform API which lets you interrogate what's there in your system. We have what we call a kernel language. It has been C-based. Very soon it's going to be also the choice of C++-based, in which you write your kernels that can be uh, executed around the system in parallel. And then a runtime API that lets you compile those kernels, distribute them out to the various processors, and gather back uh, the results. In March, we uh, launched a provisional version of the new version of OpenCL, which is OpenCL 2.1. The key things in OpenCL 2.1 is that we're transitioning from just you being able to use C for your kernels to being able to use C++. It's still a work in progress. Uh, we're hoping to finalize this later in the year. And the other big thing, which I'll talk more about uh, in a moment, is SpearV. This is an intermediate representation 
that I think is going to be used across quite a few different uh, Kronos uh, initiatives. And I think in some ways, it's even more fundamental than OpenCL, and I'll show you why. But first, OpenCL implementations. The, uh, we've had the various versions, the desktop implementations, which are also used in the cloud. Uh, if you want to have a cloud instantiation with uh, access to GPUs, uh, you can use OpenCL. Quite a few vendors, including Microsoft, are beginning to do this. Um, and the implementation comes in waves. The mobile, it's a year or two later, but mobile now is beginning to get uh, pretty good. And the first uh, OpenCL 2.0, implementations are just about to ship. The FPGA folks, Altera and Xilinx, use OpenCL 1.0 to program FPGA hardware, which is an interesting development. And the very latest uh, is that TI and Marvell are now shipping OpenCL 1.2 on their embedded DSPs and GPUs. One very interesting dynamic which has kind of informed a lot of uh, latest developments and projects inside Kronos is the realization that most people don't actually use OpenCL directly. Most people actually probably go through a library or a framework that's been, or a language that's based on top of OpenCL. We've actually counted over 200 different languages and frameworks that are using OpenCL as a compiler target uh, and a runtime backend. Um, and we think this is a trend that's going to uh, increase. One interesting uh, layer on top of OpenCL is actually from Kronos ourselves. It's called Sickle, uh, which is an initiative to enable people to do parallel programming using entirely standard C++, using all of the, the templating uh, and other rich language features in C++ to express all the same functionality that you'd have to kind of, I call, mutilate C or C++ with before, just use entirely standard C++ in a single source file, and then you can decide at runtime which parts of that C++ get executed in parallel. Again, that's another work in progress, but I think that's going to have a very fundamental effect on how we move forward. So this three-layer, I call it the three-layer ecosystem, the low-level API, the middleware frameworks uh, that support the uh, uh, application, this trend is going to increase. Spear V uh, is uh, the f intermediate representation from Kronos, is the first cross-vendor intermediate representation that support natively supports graphics and parallel computation. Uh, you can use LLVM for supporting those constructs, but you have to do it through metadata and extensions. And having a native intermediate representation that has those uh, constructs built in to the native format is mu much more uh, enabling. So we can now have multiple front-end languages such as uh, C++, C, GLSL, which is the OpenGL shading language, being compiled into Spear and Spear running on many different runtimes, including OpenCL and soon Vulkan. The developers love this because now they can choose a single front end and stick with it. Uh, they don't have to ship the source of their kernels and shaders anymore. Uh, and the drivers, because you don't have to have a complete compiler in a driver anymore, the drivers become a lot simpler. Now, this is one of the first areas where we were beginning to use uh, open source quite extensively. Um, and we're working very closely with LLVM. Again, we're trying to work cooperatively with LLVM. LLVM is awesome, and of course, a lot of people use it for their CPU-based tool chains. We think people will use Spear V for their GPU-based tool chains, and we want people to be able to interop between the two. There's a lot of open source that's going to be coming out of Kronos. Uh, the, the front ends we're going to um, put into open source, so C, C++, GLSL. We're going to be open sourcing an LLVM to Spear V converter and a validator and assemblers, disassemblers uh, for Spear V. So, as I say, I think this is going to unleash a lot of innovation in the language space, being able to run accelerated on many different platforms. Spear V is not even complete yet, but there's already a whole bunch of open source activity around Spear V. There's Python front ends, there's um, .NET front ends, so now you can use C Sharp. 
uh, to do your OpenCL kernels if you want. Um, Haskell for people in uh, doing enterprise type stuff. There's a list there, and we'll post these slides. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the next generation GPU APIs. Uh, a lot, there's been a lot of, if you're into um, graphics APIs, you'll probably have heard a lot of the industry chatter around this. There's a, a new generation APIs are beginning to emerge. There's three. Uh, there's DirectX 12, there's Metal from Apple, and Vulkan, which is the cross-platform uh, option. So uh, Vulkan is going to be available on more than one OS and one platform. Um, the hardware vendors have already committed um, to ship Vulkan uh, on everything from Windows XP all the way up through to Windows 10, whereas DX12 is only going to be available on Windows 10. But even more interestingly, a lot of platform vendors are beginning to raise their hands to support Vulkan. Uh, SteamOS from Valve, the, the Linux community, we have Ubuntu and Red Hat already have stated their support. Tizen from Samsung, and most uh, significantly, probably for many people here, Android. Back at GDC, in, uh, actually SIGGRAPH, just about eight weeks ago, uh, Google announced that they are going to make Vulkan the uh, primary GPU API on a future version of Android, which is awesome for many of us that have been wanting a platform native uh, GPU API for the longest time. So how does Vulkan work? The whole idea behind Vulkan is that the driver becomes a lot thinner. With OpenGL and OpenGL ES, uh, which are now, you know, the architecture is 20 years old, a lot, of, a lot has changed in 20 years, uh, OpenGL have a lot of significant memory and context management built into the driver error checking, whereas in Vulkan, all of that is given, all that responsibility is given to the application, so the driver is much thinner, which means the drivers are less complicated and everything is a lot more predictable. Uh, you're not going to get the driver doing some shuffling of resources to give you uh, the appearance of smooth operation. Uh, everything is going to be much more explicitly exposed to the developer, so with a lot less overhead. So you're not only are you going to be able to get more performance, you'll be able to get more reliable performance. Vulkan uses Spear V, so there's going to be no front-end compiler ever built into a Vulkan driver, which is a great simplification. And there's going to be no need for OpenGL, a Vulkan ES. Vulkan has been designed to support desktop, mobile, and embedded uh, in one framework. The key thing we couldn't fix with OpenGL in the end was multi-threading, and Vulkan has adopted a uh, very simple queuing model, but very powerful. It enables CPUs to build multiple command buffers in parallel using whatever, whatever multi-threading techniques you want to use, and then they can be constructed in parallel to being submitted to the GPU. So there's a command queue where eventually completed command buffers get submitted, but you can be building as many command buffers as you wish uh, in parallel. I think we're gonna end up with a three-layer ecosystem with Vulkan, just as we have with WebGL and OpenCL. So applications that want this amount of flexibility and power can use Vulkan directly. Many games won't need to use Vulkan directly. They'll be able to use a game engine, and the good news is we have all of the game engine vendors working to make sure Vulkan is giving them what they need. But it's gonna be a third path, and again, this is another opportunity, I think, for us to work together. Utility libraries and layers over the foundational Vulkan API to uh, ease the transition from OpenGL and to make coding easier for the developer community. So, this is my kind of first uh, question. What open source layers and libraries does the Linaro community need? We'd be really interested uh, in that uh, discussion. In OpenGL, you, you always have error checking. You can never turn it off, even if you're shipping the millionth copy of the application, which you know runs perfectly well. Vulkan takes a different approach. It has a dynamic loader. We'll be open sourcing the loader. Um, you can just run with the, with the bare driver if you know it's a trusted application, or you can load in validation and debug layers during development time. So you can build in a lot of sophisticated checking when you need it, and then take it out uh, when you don't. And it's not just a loader we're going to be putting in open source. Kronos is going to be pushing to have a lot of these uh, tools layers also open sourced uh, themselves. So another question, what 
tools would uh, Linaro developers most find useful? You know, we have a plan for what tools we're going to be producing. Are they the right ones? Again, we'd love to have that conversation. Vulkan, there's no, not going to be an ES. So Vulkan has to support a wide range of hardware from uh, low power embedded all the way up through to supercomputers. Um, so we need some feature management. Not all of that hardware is going to be the same. Vulkan defines the mechanism, but not the policy. We have a thing called feature sets. We have a, a wet range of switches, the features that can be there or not. But to avoid fragmentation, a platform will define a feature set. So if you're running on a certain OS, a certain version, this is the feature set you're going to have so the developers know uh, what to expect. And we're encouraging the platform owners to define the feature sets for their platform. If the platform vendor is not engaged, Kronos will do it for them, but it's much better if the platform can define their own feature sets. So um, please, Lenara, please help us define and maintain the feature sets uh, for your platforms that you're interested in. We've been working very hard, not just the API, to make it explicit, but the Windows systems integration. With OpenGL, after 20 years, it got pretty confused. Uh, controlling devices, controlling, controlling Windows systems integration uh, got pretty mixed up. We've taken the opportunity to make it much cleaner. Um, so Windows systems integration uh, has been separated from creating devices. And we have a very powerful uh, swap chain mechanism by which the application controls which applications, which images are being rendered to and which images are being used to present to the screen. And we've managed to uh, abstract that swap chain model with a set of standard extensions, um, which cover quite a few of the OSs out there, uh, Android, Mir, Windows, uh, Wayland, X. We think we can cover with, with the standard swap chain extensions but we've given the, the flexibility to platforms to extend, if you wish, to throw it all away and just do your own Windows integration, if you wish. Or in some systems, they won't have a Windows system at all. Just if it's a compute-only platform, you don't need a windowing system. So another question, what, what are your Windows systems integration requirements? Are they met by this model? The status on Vulkan is we started in June, about a several year ago. Um, we're uh, working hard to have the final spec before the end of this year. It'll run on any hardware from OpenGL ES 3.1 upwards and across many different uh, OSs. And the, kind of the last thing, again, because it's an opportunity for the Lara community and Kronos to work together, um, conformance tests for Vulkan. We're going to be open sourcing them. And in fact, Google have kind of stepped up and they're going to be integrating the Vulkan conformance tests into the Android test suite. Uh, so we'll have um, Android using the Vulkan conformance tests, but the Vulkan conformance tests will be available open source, and we will be accepting co contributions from the community. So if you have problems with Vulkan drivers, and you think, oh, if only they would test that, my life would be so much better, well, you can write the test, and we'll uh, integrate it into the standard uh, test suite. So perhaps you have the opportunity to leverage the open source Vulkan tests with the Lava validation uh, framework. There's some opportunity there too, I think. And really, really the last thing. Yesterday, security is the theme of the week. Um, it's almost the same thing. Safety critical working group. This is the one in the helicopter. It's a subset of OpenGL ES. It was actually done 10 years ago. OpenGL SC 1.0 used only in avionics, a very small market. But now automotive needs this too. So we've reinvigorated uh, the working group. We're planning to do an OpenGL SC 2.0, uh, which will be a certify, certifiable, minimized API with programmable shading. And we're planning to do that next year. But I think there's a much bigger picture that a lot of these emerging applications in embedded space are going to need to be safety certified. Drones will not be able to hit buildings and pylons and passenger planes, that, and a lot of that avoidance is going to be vision-based, um, a lot of compute, uh, a lot of graphics needs to be safety certified, um, and Vulcan and Spear can form a very uh, compelling foundation for this new generation of uh, secure 
safely certifiable APIs. We'd love to work with you guys on that too. So this is a list of the graphics and compute APIs. We put this up there, not to go through all the details again. We talked about Vulkan and Spear, that are shiny new things. The important message from this uh, graph is that the, the traditional APIs like OpenGL and OpenGLES are not going away. They're shipping on billions of devices. Many people are familiar with the APIs. We're not just maintaining those, they're evolving in parallel with the new generation APIs for Vulkan and, uh, Vulcan and Spear. So in, in, in conclusion, the, there's a list here of the things I went through, some of the things that perhaps we should be talking about, helping us with Vulkan, um, how can we integrate it into your platforms, how can we leverage our conformance tests, how can we innovate together on languages and frameworks using Spear V. Uh, I think there's a, a rich uh, vein of opportunity here that we would love to work with you guys on. If there are any companies here that aren't members of Cross who'd like to go, in addition to Lunaro, over to the other side to work on these APIs natively, you'd be very welcome. Any company can join, it's just 15K uh, a year. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much.